Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 253 at block height 667,502 on Sunday, January 24th. So, Janine, how is it in year four of the new? <laughs> what? <laughs> a joke about those things that we have to be careful how we talk about, or YouTube channel goes delete. Ah, yes. I see. Yes. So, Shinobi, I am very, very concerned about um, these allegations going around about terrorist financing. Well, I mean, everybody, you know, gets financing and considering half of everybody is a terrorist now, I mean, that's a rampant problem. (laughs) Terrorist. Terrorist. Financing. Shrubbery. What? And shrubistan. You you can't just go using fancy gardening terms. I don't know what those are. Lots of bushwhacking going on here. Uh Uh-huh. I guess we'll get into that later. So you're saying the man in charge is a senile gardener? Mm. Is Greg Maxwell in charge? (laughs) Oh, that was low. That was absolutely low. Dude, he posted the video. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, maybe you should illuminate me. I, I think we're speaking um, different languages at this point. Okay, I don't have it in front of me. Let me get it. And two minutes into the episode, already going down a tangent. Okay, so um, the joke is that I don't know where exactly this is coming from. I think it's some kind of weirdo BSV Slack channel. Uh, with dark mode enabled. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so Fake Toshi, uh, as we will talk about later, is threatening to sue everyone. <laughs> and he said, if a single developer breaks ranks with the other developers to fight me, I bring everyone down still. And it isn't going to be small. The copyright claims are not even the tip of the tip of the iceberg. When all the information from the PIs, as in private investigators, comes out, about all of the dirty money and involvement with drugs, child porn, money laundering, and terrorists, and saying, dot, dot, dot. Yes, so, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're funding terraces, and so Greg Maxwell made a video, I believe, of himself <laughs> um, digging <laughs> in some uh, shrubbery <laughs> uh, to, yes, make fun of this giant asshole. We really don't deserve Greg. But, yeah. Th- I think these first two stories are just full, stupid, all around. Mm-hmm. So I guess uh, we just want to get right into the first one. Yep. So, um, for, for those is broken. Who... <laughs> yes. For, That's for the news. It's all over. <laughs> Bit- We're dead. Is broken. But uh, yeah, for uh, for those of you who somehow live in such a deep hole that you don't know this, um, <laughs> Bitmax Research actually operates a uh, a software stack on top of their node um, to track things like um, colloquial double spends, um, blockchain forks where there is a race between two competing blocks and um you know interesting little blockchain data like that and um yeah on the 18th they identified a double spend and here's the funny thing um it wasn't even really a a 
double spend in the colloquial sense, which I will unwind in a second. Um, it was literally just somebody who submitted a transaction with a very low um, fee rate and used replace by fee twice. And during a stale block race, um, the miner that ended up winning that just so happened to, for whatever reason, um, they're not running RBF. Um, their node just only happened to have seen the lower fee transaction, whatever, um, confirmed the lower fee um, version of this transaction. And so BitMEX's system um, flagged that as a double spend, and it was only worth like $21. And... Um, yeah. So the, the real important thing to kind of distinguish um, here is what the hell does double spend even mean? Um, if you want to be strict in the sense of looking back at the white paper and looking at the consensus layer of the system, a double spend would be a UTXO being spent twice in the same block um, that was confirmed on the network. Um, and everybody should know that is literally impossible, um, has never happened, um, and barring some catastrophic bug nobody catches, will never happen. That term's also been for years colloquially used to describe um, sending a payment and then before it is confirmed in a block, submitting a conflicting payment and trying to get that second one um, confirmed before the original payment so that you can take a uh, you know your coffee money back um, that is incredibly rare and is also the reason why they tell you do not accept zero confirmation transactions in Satoshi's words a coin should not be considered in your wallet until it has at least one confirmation. And that's why. Because until it's in a block, that, that's it. It's not, it's not final. It can be superseded. It can be replaced. Exactly as happened here with RBF, which was literally designed to replace things that have not been confirmed yet. So enter Bloomberg. Talking about the catastrophic double spend that broke Bitcoin and calls into question the viability. <laughs> oh my god, I, I can't even do this. Um, all right, so we're just gonna skip um, right to the cherry on top of why this is so absolutely fucking hilarious. Next tech. AR Solutions is a publicly traded Canadian company that had moved some of their cash reserves into Bitcoin. They sold all of their 130 Bitcoins two days ago, literally citing the critical flaw called a double spend that undermined faith in the Bitcoin network. <gasps> a <laughs> I, again, because of that nonsense Bloomberg article, a publicly traded company sold more than a million dollars of Bitcoin that was on their balance sheet because they had absolutely no clue how this works and some incompetent fuckwit journalist published the article describing this incident as a critical flaw. Let that sink in. See, people, this is proof that just because someone has a lot of money does not mean they're smart. Yes, exactly. And furthermore, furthermore, just because they own a lot of Bitcoin does not mean they know shit about Bitcoin. Preach. And I want to tack on a little thing there at the end, too. Just because people like Michael Saylor are huge Bitcoin bulls, 
even if they convince a bunch of other publicly traded companies to put Bitcoin on their balance sheets, does not mean that you are not going to have a bunch of companies with completely moronic CEOs, CFOs, whatever position is involved in making these decisions that will at some point dump that Bitcoin to make a profit because they get spooked by things, because they don't really understand what the hell they're interacting with. And if this does not prove that, I'm sorry, continue being a Wall Street fanboy, you are a clown. Who knew? Zero Conf was not Satoshi's original vision. It's almost like he's the one who literally added the feature to show unconfirmed coins separately in the wallet balance. Wow. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, there's a really interesting um, instance of stupid in the last week. And I, just, I still like, oh my God. It, it is amazing. And I really want to see what the hell happens to this company now when they realize that they just did one of the stupidest fucking things they could have done. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess that is full stupid number one down. Am I covering the next full stupid? Indeed you are. So, surprise, surprise, everyone. Fake Toshi is back on his bullshit. On... January 20th, uh, Vlad opened a pull request in the repository for the Bitcoin Core project website titled remove bitcoin.pdf, which is the file for the white paper. And he said, the licensing status of this file is unclear. It can be found in enough places by now. And as this site is about Bitcoin Core, a specific implementation, not about Bitcoin in general, the white paper doesn't necessarily need to be hosted here. Unless anyone can point to an explicit place where Satoshi licensed it under a free license, legally it is safer to remove it from bitcoincore.org, the bitcoincore.org site. Now, this argument on its face made no sense to me because the copy of the white paper hosted on bitcoin.org is not and has not misattributed who authored it. It's not being used commercially. It's the same copy that Satoshi published in 2008. It's not a derivative. And if Satoshi gave a shit about restricting who was allowed to host it, which would be weird considering Bitcoin was released under an MIT license, which is very permissive, he had a few years. Uh, he, she, or they had a few years at least to say so. They never did. There was no indication, as far as I'm aware, that they gave a shit. Um, and if you look at the licensing for the copy on archive.org, for instance, it's in the public domain, which is understandable because everyone in their right mind considers it to be a foundational document of the industry and the copyright, uh, holding by a pseudonymous individual who we have no idea who the real identity is and is not active anymore as far as we know and may even be dead is... You know, like there's there's no risk to saying it's under the public domain or at the very least under a very, very permissive license, um, even if there's no evidence of that explicitly anywhere. But anyway, um, I mean, you could just assume that it has the same license as the code, but whatever. Um, but then on January 21st, Cobra at Bitcoin.org posted the following. Uh, yesterday, both Bitcoin.org and BitcoinCore.org received allegations of copyright infringement of the Bitcoin white paper by lawyers representing Craig Stephen Wright. In this letter, they claim they claim Craig owns the copyright to the paper, the Bitcoin name, and the ownership of Bitcoin.org. They also claim he is Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin, and the original owner of Bitcoin.org. Bitcoin.org and BitcoinCore.org were both asked to take down the white paper. We believe these claims are without merit and refuse to do so. One second while I scroll. Uh, unfortunately, without consulting us, Bitcoin Core developers scrambled to remove the Bitcoin white paper from BitcoinCore.org in response to these allegations of copyright infringement, letting, lending credence to these false claims. The Bitcoin Core website was modified to remove references to the white paper. Their local copy of the white paper PDF was deleted, and with less than two hours of public review, this change was merged. 
By surrendering in this way, the Bitcoin Core project has lent ammunition to Bitcoin's enemies engaged in self-censorship and compromised its integrity. This surrender will no doubt be weaponized to make new false claims like that, um, like that the Bitcoin Core developers know CSW to be Satoshi Nakamoto, and this is why they acted in this way. The Bitcoin white paper was included in the original project files with the project clearly published under the MIT license by Satoshi Nakamoto. We believe there is no doubt we have the legal right to host the Bitcoin white paper. Furthermore, Satoshi Nakamoto has a known PGP public key. Therefore, it is cryptographically possible for someone to verify themselves to be Satoshi Nakamoto. Unfortunately, Craig has been unable to do this, as with so many other things. Uh, we will continue hosting the Bitcoin white paper and won't be silenced or intimidated. Others hosting the white paper should follow our lead in resisting these false allegations. And that is exactly what happened. There are now dozens of sites run by individuals and companies who have published copies of the white paper. Um, for example, uh, I have a copy that is literally printed in a physical book. So good luck uh, trying to take my copy fake Toshi with your make total destroy plan abusing the legal system. Good luck taking on the entire industry at once. Um, but for anyone who isn't aware, uh, fake Toshi's claim that there is an earlier version of the white paper that he published under his real name is complete and utter bollocks, as I believe Australians would say, or maybe British people, I'm not sure. He claims that he released an abstract of the research paper, well, what he calls a research paper, under the title Black Nut um, back in 2001 for the Australian government. And ostensibly, this copy, in quotes, that he claims to have published back then, um, keyword backdated, uh, it looks like the Bitcoin paper as it was published in October 2008. The problem is, oopsies, there was actually a previous draft of the Bitcoin white paper that Satoshi shared with some people prior to publishing the final version on October 31st. So unless fake Toshi is trying to claim that he has a time travel machine, that he went back and gave his former self a copy of the final version, or that he made changes in between 2001 and 2008 and then reverted them back for whatever reason, uh, to look then like the final version, again, like he would have to have changed it twice, <laughs> which would be really weird. Uh, there is no, there's no evidence to support his claim. It once again just shows that he actually doesn't know what the hell he's talking about and is just grasping at straws as much as possible to try and trick people into thinking he's Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, yeah. Hold on a second while I sip some coffee from my mug with a cryptographically proven message or calling Craig a fraud um, for trying to claim that that address was his. Yeah, like, I mean, I'm I'm sorry. Like, um, so is um, is the issue at hand that PGP is too difficult to use? Is the person who created Bitcoin um, not? Uh, technically savvy enough to use a PGP key to sign a message. Um, that would be very strange indeed. Um, apparently I have more technical skill than Craig Wright because I signed a message with a PGP key today and uh, I had no issues. So I don't know what the excuse is there. But anyway, overall, I think that this was a good event for Bitcoin because more people should host the white paper anyway. More people should stand up so that no one individual or group can be targeted by this obnoxious patent troll. And my, like I said, my white paper copy is printed in a book. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's one, it's, it's one thing to like host a digital copy. It's another to, you know, have it printed in a book, a physical book. So come get it, bro. Um, but uh, I, I mean, so it's a bit tricky because I don't disagree with Vlad's decision to take it down because I agree that they have more important things to focus on than dealing with this. I do wish that instead of making up an argument that the licensing was unclear and therefore legally risky, that he would have just been honest about receiving the threat and said, we don't, you know, we don't want to bother with this guy, just take it down. Um, you know, it's not, it wasn't like some people are saying, oh, this is a bad precedent to set that you can just make changes with like 
no public review to the website, but guys, it's the core website and there were two other people who probably had, you know, discussions with him outside of the pull request about this. So if, I mean, these are people who manage the website already. So if you're going to make that argument, you're basically just saying that you don't trust them to make decisions like that, which is a whole other conversation. Um, like if, if you want to subject every single change to the Bitcoin core website to, to hours of, or days of public review, that's your call. Um, but yeah, I just wish he had been honest about the reasons why, because it will be very annoying if that pull request that he wrote gets used against other people who are willing to fight fake Toshi in court over this, because they can now like he can now point to that and say look even the lead maintainer of bitcoin believes the licensing is in dispute um and so yeah and he also published a letter saying that he's going to start delegating some tasks that he's been responsible for as lead maintainer and outside of this i think that that makes sense in general because that is often that's not like a shocking thing most lead maintainers when they have a project that is this huge they often spend more time onboarding people and managing contributors like people management stuff than the coding aspect um but i definitely don't think that this should push him away and i don't think we should give him a hard time about it um if anything we should just be like hey <laughs> it's too bad that you you know didn't have enough uh trust in us to back you up on this so let's back you up now uh and the takeaway from this event should be that we stand together because this loser is abusing the law he's abusing the court system and he's abusing ignorant users who don't have a clue what four coins are so let's uh let's go and fuck fake toshi up yeah i really do not understand all the backlash at core dubs i mean ultimately like anybody screaming like their input should have been considered in that well go start your own website like because last i looked it was core developers and a few others who maintained that website it's those people who would get hit with a lawsuit and have to deal with a lawsuit and all that bullshit not random people on the internet so yeah the, the outrage over that um why don't you go spin up a website then and challenge um, Craig to sue you if you're pissed off about that? Yeah, and I also think like there should be a clear distinction. This was the Bitcoin Core project website. This was not the Bitcoin code. Nothing was changed in the Bitcoin code. Um, but you know, I like the the standard for those two things is different. Um, probably my favorite uh, my favorite group to actually do what you just said is BTC pay server, which uh, they proposed to include a copy of the white paper in every BTC pay server instance, which is great. Oh yeah. One of my favorite things out of all of this, is somebody actually embedded the white paper in the blockchain and um, the DAV uh, Ivgi's Bitcoin wallet tracker tool. Um, he built in a uh, a feature into that to literally extract the white paper out of the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, so at this point, good luck. It is quite literally impossible to stop that white paper from being distributed. Yeah, I mean, if if that if that was ever his goal, he's a complete idiot who doesn't know how the internet works, which could entirely be true based on all of the things that he's said in the past. Um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting because isn't there a clip floating around where he gave an interview and he referred to Satoshi in the third person and accused Satoshi of plagiarizing him? Is that the new theory now that that oh no, I didn't I didn't actually you know, this isn't this isn't actually the white paper that I published. This is the white paper that Satoshi stole from me and published without my permission. Is that the new theory now? I'm not Satoshi, um, but Satoshi is a plagiarizer. 
if I remember that clip right, I think he immediately was then like, well, am I Satoshi? Am I not? It doesn't matter. Um, I either wrote it or Satoshi's a plagiarist. <laughs> Tried to let go, like, well, it doesn't matter which one. I will decide where this industry goes. <laughs> I own the Lightning Network. Oh my god. They will have to pay me the licensing fees. The clowns that wander clown world. And I think, I don't know... I think when Square Crypto published their copy of the white paper, then someone asked, do you have any comments on, like, who authored it? And their response was, Miles. <laughs> <laughs> fake Toshis. Fake Toshis everywhere. I want to know when they're going to send a letter to Fidelity. Or the U.S. I would, government. I would really really love to see them try to fuck with fidelity that would be hilarious like yes try try to threaten and potentially sue one of the biggest asset managers on the earth please craig please grow some balls and do it but what do we know we're just terrorist financers <laughs> digging our holes honk honk ah yeah if we just ignore him, will he go away? Uh, well, we should ask his wife. <laughs> <laughs> if he still has one. I want my popcorn, okay? Like, seriously, this is the longest I have ever waited in my life for popcorn, okay? This is too fucking low time preference for me. Come on, let, let's, let, let's crank the, the timetable up a little. Oh, so I just so when I saw that comment, um, the misspelling of terrorist instead of terrorist. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I think that's that kind of like it. Unless he's just really bad at spelling, which could be entirely possible. Um, usually, those kinds of spelling mistakes are because someone is using voice to text, like some kind of software to dictate. Um, I've seen people do that with their tweets. And so I got this like <laughs> this image in my head of Craig Wright just screaming at his computer all day. Bitcoin, a peer-to-ear electronic cash system. Ah oh, man, ah oh, man. I can just imagine him walking around in a suit with his stupid Rolex watch paid for by Kelvin Air just yelling at his computer. <laughs> so can I. So can I. In this rented Lambo. Alrighty. We, we, we got any more jokes? Any punchlines? Nope. Bye bye, Craig. Have fun staying poor. Alrighty. So, this is going to be a big chunk of Lightning Network stuff. All royalties to be paid directly to Craig Wright. He owns all the things. Alrighty. So first up, um, a new version of C Lightning 0.9.3 just hit, um, jokingly named Federal Qualitative Strengthening. I, I really need to pay more attention when C Lightning drops updates to these silly version names because they, they, <laughs> they're actually pretty hilarious. But this is coming with two new major features which are very 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 nice so the first one is they have made a general implementation of onion message routing so before this dropped um there is support in the lightning network protocol and spec to send arbitrary messages um through payment channels and obviously you know things like whatsapp um, and messaging apps have been built using that but that was very limiting because you could only route that information through actual payment channel connections and only by actually making a payment to route that message through 
So this new feature in C Lightning allows um, completely independent of the actual channel graph, um, onion messages and onion routing um, to be done on the Lightning Network. So things like um, WhatsApp and other messaging protocols, um, if you are running C Lightning um, and flip this feature on, can be done with no payment necessary. Um, no graph restrictions that have to overlap with actual payment channels for sending money. And any node that activates this can pretty much route um, onion messages through any hop that they can construct between any node using this feature. Now, this is very nice just in, in you know, replacing messaging apps. Um, and kind of creating that general communications layer between lightning nodes, but without requiring, you know, spamming payments, um, throughput restrictions of having to route that message with a payment. It's just a completely independent thing now. And that goes potentially far beyond um, <laughs> just the idea of messaging apps through the lightning network. Um, one thing, for instance, I have been thinking about for a while is piggybacking Xiaomi and eCash systems on top of the Lightning Network and being able to onion route through Lightning to maintain you know, sender-receiver privacy between each other without requiring you know, bundling things like Tor, um, you know, taking all, all of these steps to mask your network level um, security and privacy necessarily, you can just plug into a trusted node on the Lightning Network, and the Lightning net or Network itself becomes that privacy layer for something like a tossing a Xiaomi and eCash token at somebody. And I'm sure that there are going to be a lot of um, ideas in terms of protocols that you can. Okay, we've retired the Xiaomi and eCash drinking rule, Addy. No. Um, <laughs> but th there is a lot of potential um, for all kinds of other protocols to bolt on top of the Lightning Network like this. And wait, wait. given that. What, what is this drinking rule? <laughs> so some listeners have decided that anytime I mention Xiaomi and eCash, you have to take a shot. <laughs> That well, I, is retired. Well, uh, it was never in effect for me because I don't drink. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, this is um, a lot of potential stuff uh, I could see for all kinds of different uses being bolted onto lightning like this. And there is no limitation of the actual payment channel graph for all those use cases now with this. And, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are immediately thinking, well, then I will just spam your node. Um, well, one, it's completely opt-in. So this is not a universal attack vector that would be open to any lightning node. And two, um, there's all kinds of other ways that you can deal with spam like that other than demanding payments over lightning. Um, for instance, proof of work. I mean, wasn't <laughs> one of the original proof of work um, implementations specifically for stopping email spam? Like, there are lots of ways that you can deal with things like that besides just a micropayment over Lightning. So, this is a pretty big step forward. Um, and I really want to see what people start tinkering with this. Um, Starting with, I'm assuming, messaging apps that don't require payments for every message. The next thing in the update is payment offers. So I believe we actually covered this um, a couple episodes ago before the end of last year. But um, Rusty, or Rusty Russell proposed a new bolt um, to replace the general invoice system right now. Um, with something that would allow a static um, invoice, so to say, um, that could be put somewhere. And in scanning that, your node would actually ping the receiver's lightning node, get a normal invoice there, 
and then actually pay that invoice so that you don't have to deal with the one-off um, kind of restrictions of invoicing, things like that. And also has support for recurring payments. So you could get something like that static invoice for a monthly subscription to something. And with some margin of error on either side of the subscription lapse date, um, you know, just kind of ping that note again, get a new invoice and have the wallet automatically pay that. So that's been experimentally turned on. And um, let's kind of see where that goes. Now Shinobi mm -hmm. needs a sip of water. Drink. <laughs> Alrighty. So next up, um, another thing from Blockstream. Um, they have released a uh, backend infrastructure piece for light nodes um, or light wallets for lightning called LN Sync. And the entire purpose behind this is kind of dealing with a uh, little bit of a UX problem when you turn on a Lightning wallet that hasn't been on in a while. And that's the fact that your routing graph of the whole network, which you use to decide the path to route a payment through, um, is probably going to be kind of outdated if you've left your wallet off for a while and just turned it back on. And under the current gossip protocol, um, your wallet pretty much has to scan the entire network, um, receive a bunch of information from nodes it's connected to, and update that routing graph. And it's actually kind of a problem where um, if you spin up your wallet after leaving it alone for a while, um, you might actually have a payment failure trying to make a payment right away. And not because there is no route to make that payment, but because your wallet's outdated routing graph um, is not aware of new nodes or channels that could route that payment. And that can kind of take a few minutes sometimes, um, depending on how long you've left the wallet off for that graph to get updated. So Blockstream's new project, LN Sync, um, is pretty much just a backend server um, that would constantly be tracking um, changes, um, you know, new channels opening, channels being closed, et cetera, over the overall routing graph, and would allow light wallets to pretty much ping that backend server. And instead of going through the whole crawl of updating the entire graph from peers on the network, could get a succinct, efficient update from the server that's pretty much just tell me the last time you were online and I will quickly send you anything that's different since the last time you've been on instead of the full gossip sync um, through other peers on the network. And then at that point, um, you know, your wallet just goes back to normal, um, kind of cleaning things through the normal gossip protocol. But a backend server um, kind of running this function can speed that up ridiculously for light wallet users who kind of just want to pull their phone out, scan something and make a payment and not sit there for a minute or two if a payment fails before they can actually find a, a route to get that through. So this is definitely um, a huge improvement for actually trying to push Lightning more for just general consumer retail payment things. Um, because that is a little bit of a UX friction point. And hopefully, um, we start seeing a lot more people besides Blockstream um, running a backend service like this and instances of this, because this is a uh, pretty nice user experience improvement. And it would be really sad if um, you know only one company ran this and a lot of wallets became dependent on that. I interrupt our scheduled programming to bring you more fake Toshi nonsense. Oh god, what now? So, uh, while you were talking, I was feeling annoyed about the fact that I have to keep refollowing Dan Darkpill on Twitter because Twitter is being stupid. And one of his latest tweets 
uh, is a screenshot of another <laughs> CSW message where he says, The wonderful thing with Discovery is that I'm going to go through every little minor aspect of every dev's life. Every single person who has purchased a hooker while they are at a conference using Bitcoin will find that it becomes public. Of course, that is not always criminal, but some of these people are married. <laughs> Wait a minute. They were selling hookers at Bitcoin conferences and nobody fucking told me? Are you fucking kidding me? What the fuck? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry to disappoint uh, the Calvin Ayers in the room, but um, yeah, we don't really do that kind of thing, and we especially don't do it with girls that look like their children. So... <laughs> Also, this message, it's almost like he's speaking from experience. Do you get that impression, Shinobi? You know, the pictures that I've seen of him on the big boats and things with women in bikinis. I feel like he's speaking from experience. Yeah, generally when, um, you know, men start throwing things like that around, it's because they think that it's normal when it's, it's, it's really not. You know, mo most men don't buy hookers they don't do things like that also can you imagine the headline that could be made of this craig wright tries to ruin the marriages of bitcoin core devs <laughs> <laughs> this is literally a soap opera Yo, I am starting to see a show graphic card form in my head ah oh, boy I mean, I mean, this. Uh, I, this also says a lot about the kinds of developer meetings happening over at PSP. If they think that core developers are just going to conferences to buy hookers, Shit, like, I'm, have I'm you like... have you seen those conferences? Do you see them sitting around in t-shirts and jeans, staring at a screen for hours on end? <laughs> you know what? Honestly, this is just like. Christ. Okay, okay, okay. Time to be serious again. Still need to get through the rest of the lightning block. On another note, um, you know, of all the terrible things that he could have possibly found if all he found was people purchasing hookers, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> it's like, oh, groundbreaking discovery. All right, I just, we have to move on Bitcoin before I just start going too far off the deep end. Breaking news. Lonely nerds seek the company of attractive women. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. We, 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 we've, we've got to progress forward. <laughs> There's actual information to get there. Go on. Alrighty then. We should probably cut all that out. Ah, <laughs> uh, we'll see. All right. So there has been published another analysis of privacy on the lightning network uh by george kapos harun youssef uh ania piotrowska sanket i'm i'm just gonna butcher these names as we go on um sanket uh kanjilkar um sergey delgado segura andrew miller and sarah michael john um Pretty much a split of people from um, the co university college in London, um, UIC um, by me here in Illinois, um, NIM Technologies, PISA Research, and IC3. And this is actually a pretty comprehensive analysis of things that it looks like they've pretty much been working on for the last year or so. Um, I think one of the earliest mentions of a uh, date they were actually running the experiments for this was March 2020. So this has been a pretty um, long going endeavor. Um, and they've actually been talking to a lot of the lightning devs before this was published the other day. So there are actually a few different things that were kind of analyzed in this. Um, different layers of ways you can attack the privacy of things on Lightning. Um, kind of all the way from analyzing things on chain to learn more about um, channel opening and closing to actually analyzing off-chain activity on the network itself. 
So first up um, is pretty much the on-chain aspects of things. So um, every public channel on the Lightning Network is actually advertised in the routing graph with um, the opening transaction ID, um, the total balance available in that. Um, so that is kind of default leaked information. And from that point, um, you're able to really observe when those channels close 100% um, definitively, how the balance was distributed between those channels. And there are some patterns that kind of pop out here in that the vast majority of these channel closures um, had a single output. So effectively, that entire channel was depleted um, in one direction and then closed. Um, I think somewhere around a little less than a third of those closures had two outputs with some of the balance distributed to each side of the channel. And a very, very tiny percentage, um, a little more than a percent, had more than two outputs. So these are all just the public channels um, announced on the graph that are available for anyone to observe. Now, from here, um, they started looking at analyzing and trying to identify private channels based on on-chain activity. So there are some obvious identifiers here. Um, one, um, under the spec, you use a pay to witness or witness script hash address. Um, by spec, um, non cooperative closures have a non zero sequence number. So you're actually iterating the sequence number in a transaction based on the channel state. And um, also, the aspect of um, kind of how addresses are reused in channel opening and closure is also a fingerprint. And looking at all of these, they were able to pull together um, 267,000 something transactions that potentially represented a channel closure. But by requiring all of the fingerprints um, be present instead of just some of them, um, pretty much boiled it down to 77,000 something transactions that could potentially be um, private lightning channels opening and closing. Now, <clears throat> that is an upper bounds, um, and they themselves point out that there is a decent margin of error there because there's no guarantee that these aren't just um, you know, non-lightning transactions. Now, from here, um, they can actually look at the um, the peeling pattern over time of channels being open and closed by a single entity. And a pattern they observed here <clears throat> is that a lot of times um, when somebody opens a channel and then peels off change, um, that change output is also used to itself open a channel. And so to kind of differentiate it from a normal peeling chain spending funds on chain, you can look at those fingerprints like the two of two address, um, you know, any kind of sequence number fingerprint during a non-cooperative closure. And from there, another pattern emerged where a lot of times um, change outputs um, that were not immediately put into channels or soon after um, were frequently merged back together with the outputs of a closed channel um, to go and open another channel again. And so the, the peeling pattern along with some other metadata um, gives a pretty decent chance of, you know, in totality here, identifying private channel outputs on chain um, and also kind of clustering the UTXOs of specific lightning channel operators um, and creating a, a transaction graph um, showing those different clusters of ownership over time as node operators open and close channels um, with a varying degree of success in terms of being able to identify 
one or both um, participants in that channel. Now, <clears throat> this part here, um, that is pretty bad. And this is a, you know, a huge reason why Lightning needs things like Schnorr and Taproot because you can bury a lot of that data. Um, you know, you can make it impossible to distinguish a two of two multi-sig from a single sig address. And when you start, you know, thinking about redesigning Lightning under Schnorr and Taproot, you know, a decent amount of these heuristics start getting broken. Like you can't really identify some of these fingerprints anymore to come to these conclusions about on-chain activity. And that is just a massive, massive necessity for Lightning to really have any hope of real privacy in the long term because, you know, <laughs> if fingerprints like these are detectable, then you're going to be able to suss out whether something is using an off-chain protocol like this or not. And Another huge thing that could actually um, come into the picture and address some of these on-chain issues is the idea of a fidelity bond, of pretty much having nodes stake coins not connected to their actual channels in order to prove they have real money to route with rather than publicly doxing those channel UTXOs themselves. Because the whole reason you do that is so that you don't have a bunch of fake Sybil nodes with no real coins constantly getting payments stuck um, when you try to route through them and they can't. So really, like this aspect of the paper just goes to show those two developments or, or solutions to these issues are very necessary because e even looking at the you know the error rates potentially in some of this, I mean that is just way too much information leaking publicly to have any real confidence of privacy. Shinobi. I'm sorry, I need to drink some water. There's still a lot more. Shinobi, what's a UTXO? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> When's that coming out? Um, it should be sometime this week. Alrighty, though. All right. First part of paper down. So the second part of this is actually discovering the balance available in different channels. Um, so in the routing graph, <clears throat> you're seeing the, um, the total capacity of a channel in the routing graph, like that is default available. But what you don't see <clears throat> until you try to route a payment is how is that balance distributed through that channel? So pretty much their thoughts in this paper were <clears throat> effectively surround a node that you want to <clears throat> glean balance information about with your node or two of your nodes on each side of it. And pretty much from here, um, you know, um, this is pretty much kind of generalizing previous um, attacks like this to glean this information that depended on error messages that nodes would give. But um, that kind of depends on those error messages not changing, um, not being taken into account, and kind of details blurred out of that. Um, and so pretty much just surrounding a target node on both sides um, you just route payments to yourself, um, bouncing from either very valuable or low and kind of petering that back and forth until you found a range where under or over it, um, it can't route a payment and then it succeeds on the other side. And then you've been able to figure out what the actual distribution of money in that channel is. Now, <clears throat> this... Um, this would require a lot of nodes on the network and um, you know a lot of payment activity, I think, to really deploy. But um, 
you know, looking at the current topology of the network, there are a lot of really big nodes um, and central points in the network. Like I think um, LN Biggs node is something like 40% of the entire Lightning Network's capacity. Um, so, you know, this is definitely something in practice to worry about with um, larger channel providers that are very well connected in the um, routing graph. Now, um, the next part of this is kind of um, complicated, but at a high level, it really just boils down to kind of guessing with different probabilities um, of being accurate. And this, um, they actually ran, um, or yeah, I'm sorry, um, to, to differentiate this from other sections, um, some of this was actually done with real um, public data, such as all, all the um, on-chain analysis of things. And other aspects of this paper were done with a simulation of the Lightning Network based on historical um, graph data. And this is part of this that was done with the simulation. But um, you, you can pretty much um, guess as a routing node um, whether or not the nodes directly adjacent um, to you on either side are the actual source um, or destination of a payment. And in reality, um, this kind of works out that um, a lot of payments on the network because of these big important central nodes are really only a couple of hops. And essentially, um, how this distributed in the simulation is the longer that hops are, um, obviously the percentage of the success rate um, in guessing goes down, but the shorter they are, you know, it starts getting more and more accurate and just kind of take that for what it's worth in terms of, you know, think most payments on the lightning network right now are really only three to four hops. Um, so that again is something that could actually have um, potential issues here. And this um, last section is E. Um, this would require a, a lot of opening channels, um, having a lot of liquidity on the network, but essentially by um, doing a, a massive amount of that balance discovery attack, <clears throat> kind of um, ping-ponging um, money back and forth between two nodes with some in the middle that you're trying to find the channel actual balance distribution for. Um, by doing that systematically and kind of creating snapshots of the entire network and how those channel balances are distributed between them, um, you can pretty much just start um, deductively figuring out where payments have likely gone through the network by just comparing um, snapshots of the network balances um, across channels on the whole network and just seeing where that money is flowed in different amounts and kind of sussing out, you know, where this channel's balance changed was a bunch of payments being netted. So look on both sides of that and see how those balance changes and effectively suss out individual payment movements um, just based on those net changes. And again, um, you know, this is kind of one of those things, it can become more or less accurate depending on how often you are taking these snapshots. Um, you know, obviously the more frequently, the more accurate, the less frequently, the less accurate. But this is something that can be done um, potentially. Um, I think they, their analysis was, you know, like uh, locking up a hundred something Bitcoin with um, a Bitcoin or so to actually achieve um, the liquidity attraction to get all these channels set up. And um, yeah, that is pretty bad. Um, so 
those are pretty much um, the four different aspects of privacy that they looked into with this research. And, you know, for the most part, um, yeah, um, it's a lot of reality kicking in here. Um, but, you know, I can't really think in terms of this last issue of global balance snapshots, how to deal with that aside from you know, nodes regularly rebalancing or shuffling things around that aren't really related to actual payments to try and screw up what you can deduce um, from those balance snapshots. But um, yeah, I, I think this paper is just one, one more thing kind of showing lightning is very, very early um, and still has a lot of things needed in terms of main chain functionality and thinking through how the off chain aspects of this works before this can actually be the, um, the privacy tool that a lot of us want it to be. Mm -hmm. I need more agua. <sighs> Alrighty. So next up, um, used Jaeger. Um, Clark Burkhart and Philip Shepard um, all played a little game in the last week and um, simulated a griefing attack on the Lightning Network. So <clears throat> th this is the, the attack where you would effectively clog up and use um, the maximum 483 HTLCs that a channel can have and then refuse to settle any of them with the peers um, so that they would be forced to close that out on chain with a very expensive fee or potentially open the door for blackmailing and getting a little ransom out of it before agreeing to settle out and fail all the HTLCs in the channel. And, you know, obviously this kind of... Uh, went exactly how you thought it would. Um, very quickly, the victim node in this setup um, had their entire HTLC capacity clogged um, and actually started um, crashing the nodes. And, you know, th this kind of also demonstrates a lack of, you know, tooling for users to actually observe what's going on with their node at any one time. Um, you know, there's a number of different um, dashboards to hook onto Lightning nodes to manage them. Um, you know, two of the biggest are um, Real Time Lightning and Thunderhub. And um, Thunderhub apparently is the only one um, that will actually show you how many pending HTLCs you have in a channel at any time um, that aren't settled. And the actual Lightning node and Thunderhub um, started crashing when they had their HTLCs maxed out and had a lot of funny issues. Um, for instance, the node was um, not responding as if it was offline, even though it, it was online. Um, and so pretty much it, it just shows, you know, how cheap and easy it is to do this kind of attack. And, you know, used points out again that uh, you might want to do this not just to fuck with somebody or ransom somebody but potentially attack routing competitors with lower fees to drive up your revenue and fee income when that is no longer a um a viable alternative to you in terms of routing payments on the lightning network um so yeah uh it is uh really important i think to have used circuit breaker project which can dynamically throttle how many HTLCs will be allowed at a time per channel um, fleshed out and kind of baked into lightning implementations as a default thing and this experiment also exposed um, two interesting bugs in LND um, so apparently when you have maxed out um, all the HTLCs in a channel and somebody attempts to forward another one, um, 
it will pretty much just fall into an endless loop where it will keep trying to forward this HTLC through a channel it can't, um, which will crash the node, which will attempt to come online and reconnect to the network. And another bug um, where for whatever reason, an invalid signature for a commitment transaction is generated, which leads to the node auto um, force closing the channel. So with these bugs present, um, doing this kind of attack would effectively, like there is not, there wouldn't even be an option until this bug is fixed to try to pay a ransom and get the HTLCs closed in the channel because these bugs would just lead to the client automatically force closing it and hitting you with the very expensive on-chain fee. So yeah. Um, there definitely needs to be a lot more of those dashboard setups for controlling lightning nodes that allow you to monitor things like this. And um, circuit breaker needs to be a default thing in lightning nodes pronto. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Last up in the lightning block. OKCoin okay, is planning on integrating Lightning Network in quarter one of 2021. Um, I don't know. Yay, more exchanges finally getting on board with Lightning. I don't really care because this is a Chinese exchange that I will never use and have never trusted. So, yay. Yay. <laughs> I will never use any exchanges. Yay. I can't. I can't reciprocate that yay so lightning block completed i think we have some updates from a sane person who has finally had enough with shitcoin land yes so um i think i don't know if we covered when the uh what was it called zcash open i can't remember what it stands for the zcash uh grant committee um, I don't remember if we covered when Sarah Jamie Lewis joined it, but I think that was last year sometime. Um, and as of yesterday, she announced that she is resigning from it. Um, oh yes, major, so it stands for Open Major Grants, um, Zcash Open Major Grants, or Zo oh My God. <laughs> um, yeah, so she kind of wrote a really long post about why, and I personally... Um, I'm not surprised in the slightest. I was kind of anticipating this would happen because I consider Sarah to be a serious person when it comes to things like privacy and security, and I do not have the same view about Zcash in that regard. So let's just read the letter because it's great. Um, so she wrote, today I'm writing to announce my resignation from the Zcash Foundation Technology Advisory Board, also known as the Major Grant Review Committee, and my intent to not participate in further instances of the Community Advisory Panel. In the interest of having this post understood, I will try to keep the following sentences short. When I put forward my candidacy, I did so because the world needs censorship-resistant private transactions. The communities I live and work in need financial privacy. I believe that Zcash had a rare combination of robust technology, a community of amazing technologists, and the beginnings of an ecosystem that had a chance to deliver on that vision. The events of the last week have shown me that I need to take some time to reevaluate this belief. It is now clear that the vigorous commitments to privacy and radical transparency I made during my candidacy are not aligned with the current desires of much of the community. I now see through recent conversations on the forum and in other spaces that many of the issues I set aside as temporary and localized are deeper and systemic to core parts of this ecosystem. While those may be fixable on some horizon, I don't perceive a will in the community to even acknowledge them, let alone work towards fixing them. One second while I scroll. On a personal note, I chose to undertake this work voluntarily. But it is clear that any attempt to uphold these principles in the scope of a role in the Zcash Open Major Grants Committee would exhaust far more effort than I would consider reasonable with little to no expectation of impact and a constant background of personal attacks with core community members. There are more effective ways for me to contribute to the larger goal of systems that enforce, consistent and res and, uh, enforce consent and resist censorship and surveillance. 
I would like to take this opportunity to thank my committee colleagues. We had many great discussions in my limited time on the committee. I do believe that there exists some will on the committee to move in the direction of positive change, but it is clear that, I, that while I remain on the committee, any such movement would be misattributed solely to me and not the collective, and as such, my presence is likely to hinder any progress that might be possible. I wish Zcash the Zcash community the best in the hopes that you can one day see over the horizon and deliver on a vision that the world desperately needs. I will sign off with the following thoughts. Once again, I uh, promising security or privacy is a responsibility you shouldn't take lightly. It's not about you, and frankly, it's not about you at all. People will put their lives in your hands. The mission must always be about their ability to manage risk and reduce harm. It must always be about their safety and informed consent. The only way to build a robust system is to open it up to the world, to have it be radically transparent from end. You must not shy away from accountability. Privacy is not a responsibility you should take lightly. It's not fast or glamorous or easy. It's not a path to riches. The thing you are supposed to be decentralizing is power. We don't do those things because they are efficient. We do them because to keep us accountable to those who entrust us. Wait. We don't do those things because they are efficient. We do them because... Uh, we do them to keep us accountable to those who entrust us with some of the most precious parts of their lives. Large amounts of funding in the space should come with the expectation of responsibility. If you want trivial responsibilities, take on trivial projects. And that's actually a quote from Naomi Wu um, when she was talking about uh, building, a, I think it was some kind of respirator or some kind of device to help a woman breathe. and. Um, she realized when she had shipped it out that there was an issue with it, and so she did everything she could to make sure it got fixed before it was actually used because it was someone's life on the line. And so she said, you know, just because you're working for free doesn't mean that you don't have any responsibility. Um, and if you if you aren't prepared to handle that responsibility, then don't take on <laughs> don't take on big projects where people's lives could be at risk. Um, so the interesting thing about this post is that if you read the the rest of the thread the responses under it everyone just instantly started talking about how it was sexism like the problem is sexism and actually sarah didn't say anything about sexism the the disagreement the dispute that she's referring to i haven't read every everything about it yet but basically um, some some kind of disclosure was made about a vulnerability in the Zcash wallet, the main one, Zek wallet, uh, a while ago, and it was so it was like such a huge vulnerability that Sarah like disclosed it publicly immediately so that people wouldn't use the wallet because it was that bad, <laughs> um, and that really pissed off the developer of that wallet that uh, he i guess they they thought it was irresponsible of her to do that which is blech, that whole <laughs> the, the whole like, concept of irresponsible disclosure is messy um but yeah anyway so all a lot of the replies below this are about how oh we need to fight sexism but actually she didn't talk about sexism and maybe there was problems with sexism but that was not the main point of this letter the main point was that she didn't believe that they actually were living the values that they claim to hold. Uh, and actually, I would say it's sexist to assume that just because a woman is bringing up an issue in a community and is resigning as a result of that, why why do we have to assume it's because of sexism? Like, if, if that's not actually the argument, like, I feel like that in itself is, is sexist, but whatever. Um, yeah, so some of the replies were pretty awful, and I, yeah, I completely agree with her analysis because I had the same ob observations about the Zcash community before, um, starting with the fact that they held a conference where they were taking photos of everyone and then uploading them into a Google Shared Drive, and when I said, hey, did you, like, you know maybe ask these people for consent first before you took their photo. And I got sworn at by the photographer. Uh, I think it was, his name was like Steve Mickey or something. Steve McKee. I can't remember. Um, didn't really get any backup from that. 
uh, on that by anyone from Zcash. There was also the incident where uh, I used uh, the Markup's new blacklight tool to see what kinds of, you know, weird trackers or anything might be on certain websites. And one of the ones that I tested was the Zcash Foundation website. And it turned out that there was a, uh, because of a Stripe integration for something on their newsletter or their forum, which was not actually necessary, like it was not a necessary thing to have this Stripe thing. It was just something came bundled with whatever they were using. It was actually doing browser fingerprinting, which is really weird for the Zcash Foundation uh, website to be doing. And uh, the director, well, at the time he had become the former director of the foundation, but basically I was mocked for like, oh, that's not even the real website. And actually it was. So yeah. And Sarah was the only one who took it seriously. So I fully anticipated this happening. It doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Um, not, not a good day for Zcash. Private, but not for criminals. Yes, I believe I believe it was, uh, yeah, not not private enough for criminals or yeah. I mean, it's just like shit coin memes. I still have yet to see anything besides Monero doing anything meaningful in any way to improve privacy outside of Bitcoin. Like, get the fuck out of here! <laughs> it's just so funny to see like rational people like this just go all right i've had enough i'm calling bullshit yeah i mean i don't precisely remember when this i remember seeing her post about the grant committee before i don't recall exactly when she joined it but i'm pretty sure that it wasn't more than a year so that was pretty fast yep you know actually she deserves a clap for making it through almost a year of that in 2020 of all years. Yeah. And I think for being on the committee, she was, I think committee members were only getting paid like, was it 500 a month? I think it was, it was not a lot of money or maybe I can't remember exactly what the amount was, but like they were not getting paid a lot. Like it's, it's just, I don't know. The Zcash community is just really bizarre like every every person i've encountered from zcash outside of the person the the people who just temporarily are in it is just i don't understand so zuku paid for their groceries yeah maybe <laughs> but that's so i'm gonna have to read through i mean this is all in the forums by the way it's really funny like the, this forum that they use I don't know I've I've never actually I've only ever seen this forum software be used for Zcash maybe I haven't been in enough forums but um, as I was reading it it was like even though, even though I was using it over Tor it was like instantly updating when people posted new things I like, like I didn't I've never had a forum where it auto updates live so that is a bit strange but there kind of was a lot of hints in the replies that that there there was a lot of like complaining without naming about people at the electric coin company like leadership at ECC being toxic, which I find interesting. I wonder who they're referring to. I wonder. But yeah, it's going to be uh, interesting in the next year or so as Bitcoin gets Schnorr and Taproot and then potentially can do atomic swaps with Monero and maybe even ring signature shit with Monero. Who knows? Uh, I mean, at that point, what is the point of Zcash anymore? I mean, if we really want to use your knowledge proofs, uh, well, first of all, Monero has those. So if you, you, if you can swap into Monero, you can use zero knowledge proofs. Not the same ones as Zcash, but different. Uh, so, like, what, what, what is the point of Zcash anymore? There is none. Alrighty, though. So, incompetent shitcoiners. Next up, incompetent governments. There is some overlap. Cool. So, 
Um, over the last week or two, um, there have been a lot of um, power outages and grid issues in Iran um, to the point, um, I, I believe they've uh, been having to burn um, dirtier oil to generate electricity. So that's even creating massive uh, smog in areas like Tehran. Um, the government has decided that this is uh, all Bitcoin miners' faults. So um, they've been going around um, seizing illegal mining operations um, ASICs lately. Um, as of the 17th, they seized 45,000 um, machines. And uh, the power utility claims that something like uh, 95 megawatts uh, an hour of electricity were consumed by these illegal operations. And apparently um, have just moved as of yesterday to shutting down um, legal licensed mining operations as well. Um, pretty much blaming the um, electricity outages and the grid problems on Bitcoin miners. Now, I'm not going to say that um, there is no chance that Bitcoin mining has anything to do with grid issues. Um, you know, we, we've seen little micro instances of stuff like this in different um, towns and areas in uh, America, for instance, um, which were quickly dealt with by power utilities, um, cutting some of the power to mining operations. But that was generally due to things like um, it is winter, so power consumption goes up quite a lot for things like... Um, you know, heating, um, vice versa in the summer. But I'm also kind of wondering how much of the issue in Iran is just the fact that this is a sanctioned country that has been in a lot of ways cut off from the rest of the world and the global economy. And their grid is just having issues because, hey, um, that still needs to be maintained. Um, that still needs to be fixed and monitored and um i don't know when countries find themselves in hard positions like iran is in um a lot of those things tend to get deprioritized or go to the wayside so yeah um i'm not really sure um how the distribution uh, of blame is here but I would probably wager that mining is nothing but an exacerbation to some degree of an already existing problem that was not just caused because Bitcoin miners are there. So yeah, um, quite an interesting turn um, to see in two months a country's central bank um, declare themselves the only legal purchasers of uh miners mining rewards and then turn around and start shutting miners down and blaming power grid issues on them yep so next up um is the snail finally getting off to the race yeah so this is just a psa that there is a irc meeting being organized for february 2nd on tuesday at uh, 7 p.m. UTC uh, to discuss taproot activation, in, specifically in the taproot activation channel. Um, and it says the, the, the email that was sent to the Bitcoin Dev mailing list by Michael Folkson says the primary objective will be to finalize the revised BIP-8 activation method, but general question, questions or discussion on taproot activation are welcome too. There are lots of prior contacts, so please do sufficient pre-rating in advance of attending if you would like to participate. Please be adults and don't just scream activate it tomorrow with the UASF. That is going to be an interesting thing to see though and see the fallout from because I am betting most developers are going to be very hesitant to put their hat in any specific ring. It's Especially with a gigantic douche nozzle bitch like Craig Wright um, threatening lawsuits over frivolous, stupid shit.
Yeah, what, is he going to claim that he patented Taproot now? No, but maybe just, you know, continue threatening, finding baseless ways to litigate against developers and shit, and just in general attempt to make their life hell, because, hey, your shitcoin is plummeting into the garbage while Bitcoin is not. What? Uh, speaking of which, I found it really hilarious when I went on um, Citadel Dispatch. Uh, afterwards, there was some people from the BSV space who were replying, um, saying, "Oh, it's a great discussion. Have you heard of Twitch or whatever you call it?" Twitch. <laughs> and I just, I just looked at that. And I'm like, okay, like, like clearly these people do not know who the hell we are because if they did they would know that that's an extremely stupid question i think it was just reply spam like if they had any brains whatsoever but then we literally had this i mean i don't know if there's an actual ceo but someone calling himself the ceo of twitch who by the way i mean if anyone hasn't heard craig wright is against privacy and anonymity he doesn't like the idea of people not using their fully legal birth names in everything they do on the internet. And I found it hilarious that the CEO of Twitch was calling himself Kermit something or other and had a Kermit the Frog. So yeah, that's his Twitter handle. But then his, his name was something to do with his profile picture was like Kermit the Frog. And like, clearly this is not a real person. And I was just like, what, first of all, what are you doing in bsv space if craig wright is your overlord and two like seriously get out of my get out of my mentions because there's no fucking he said some he said something along the lines of you know building impactful software is a is not an easy job or it's a thankless job and i was like bitch you haven't done any (laughs) anything worth being praised for in your life (laughs) from what i can tell if you're working on this shit but janine twatter on a blockchain yeah good luck with that i think twitter has finally allowed me to follow dan darkville Woohoo! i beat you to it i was following him yesterday took like an hour okay i have been unfollowed what the fuck twitter stop so i followed him yesterday too but it keeps unfollowing me multiple times it doesn't matter how many times i click it it will like stick for like 10 minutes and then I come back later and it's gone again. Damn it, it did it to me too. Damn it. Ah, well. Well, I guess that is the uh, the last thing now. He's here. So, super quick update. No real facts. Bitfinex says that it is almost done providing documents demanded by the New York Attorney General's office. They plan to be done in the next 30 days. That is all. Yes, to everybody who forgot that's going on, yes. um, Bitfinex is still being sued by the New York Attorney General's office for financial fraud and trying to charge them with shit related to Tether under the Securities Act, which makes no fucking sense because Tether is not a security. It's not an investment. It does not appreciate or generate a return. Um, So yeah, maybe sometime next month um, we'll get to see what other fun stuff the Attorney General's office comes up with when Bitfinex finally gives them the documents they've been shrieking for? That is all. And this is your Julian Assange update that he is still in Belmarsh Prison. It is winter in the UK. He hasn't been given his warm clothes. He is having to insulate his cell with books because the cold air is seeping through the window. Uh, and this is all happening despite the fact that the judge refused to grant extradition to the U.S. And for some weird reason, um, despite the fact that she denied the extradition request on the basis that, you know, his health was so poor and his mental state would not be able to survive the terrible uh, reality of U.S. prisons, 
Uh, she forgot to recall the fact that he is in this condition because he's been imprisoned in the UK for all this time or held under some kind of detention at the behest of the UK government. So logically, you would think that means he should get released from prison, especially during a pandemic, but apparently not. Even if you win a decade-long case, which that is effectively what it did, uh, apparently that is enough, uh, not enough to get you out of prison. So now we have to wait for either the Biden administration to finally get off its ass and say, you know, because apparently one of the prosecutors in the case, I think I mentioned this before, but one of the prosecutors in the case uh, who was on his way out of being in that position uh, said that he didn't even think the Biden administration would continue to pursue the case. And yet the U.S. government is still appealing it. So this is literally just wasting all of our time. There is no point to this. Just drop it and go away and let him out of Guantanamo Bay, uh, known as British Gitmo. Some White House staffers should just put a pardon in front of Biden and tell him it's the Green New Deal. I think what we should do is put dress up Assange as a little girl and have Biden stand behind him so that he can sniff his hair and maybe he'll let him go <laughs> after that. Like seriously, I don't I can't think of any sane reason to celebrate having him as president like even the people who are like well he's the lesser evil like what <laughs> it's like yes your lesser evil is someone who creeps on little girls um like what <laughs> also put I, us back in syria on day two to send, send more troops in that, that's fine like, calm down people the wars are back everything is normal again well, that's the fun part. I mean, the war has never ended, and nobody in the last four years stopped them, really. Um, so, yeah. Anyone who still thinks that they're going to get any kind of change out of voting people into office, I hope you don't have to spend another four years uh, fixing your mind on that. His name was Michael Hastings. Yes. So, yeah, uh, I guess that's a final thought time. Got any huh. more thoughts? I will just uh, repeat something that I saw in a photo from Archelect, which is that a guest plus a host equals a ghost. Ghost. And I guess my, my last comment for the day is an in interest of American national security. Stop inciting erections <laughs> i i just ate ice cream before the show so my brain is like not good right now <laughs> <laughs> you didn't see you didn't see that on, on the senate floor no um chuck but schumer that... so eloquently put um you know, Trump's incitement of erections. <laughs> well, well, luckily, you know, with, uh, with the age of most people that are in Congress, I don't think it's possible to incite erections enough to get anything to happen there. So good luck with that. <laughs> All right. And Take some the real note, magic there. On the note of that dick joke, <laughs> we'll catch you later, punks. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> <laughs>